five, but I won't save the ten. Yeah. Your Honor, this appeal is not about whether the statutes are constitutional. It's not about whether the statutes are unconstitutional. This appeal is about whether the second amended complaint alleges all the elements required by federal case law to state the cause of action upon which relief may be granted for unconstitutional impairment of the obligation of contract under the federal constitution. As we have discussed and explained in our briefs, in the initial brief and in our reply brief, the second amended complaint contains those elements and states that cause of action. Let me stop you there. And I'm going to assume for the moment that you clearly have alleged something that would be an infringement of contract. What I'm a little bit concerned about is the forum and the parties in this thing. What I'm concerned about is whether the circuit court was the right forum and whether you've got the right parties to proceed on this. Because your theory is that the utility companies are sending your clients bills that include money related to the construction of the or expenses related to non-productive nuclear power plants, right? Well, our theory is that the statute allows them to do that. Well, the statute allowed them to seek a rate for that. And I gather they're charging your clients because the PSC authorized a rate that includes this. Is that correct? Well, Your Honor, that's at the center of the controversy in the case. If we're going to discuss that. Well, let me ask you this. Is it your theory, because I didn't see it in the complaint, that Duke Energy is charging your customers, your clients, for nuclear expenses that the PSC has not authorized them to? No, Your Honor. Okay. No, that's not the case. Okay. So if someone's infringing your contract, isn't it the PSC? No, Your Honor, because we are not attacking their regulation of the PSC implementing the statute. All right. The U.S. Constitution prevents the state from infringing on your contract rights. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So who is it in this lawsuit that is the state infringing on your contract? Who is infringing? The law is infringing on the contract because the law says, the law provides for a mechanism that allows the utility and allows the PSC to allow the utility. But if you don't have the PSC in your lawsuit. No, we do not, Your Honor. How could the circuit, you know, assuming the cause of action is completely valid, how can the circuit court or this court order Duke not to charge a rate that was approved by the PSC and probably by the Florida Supreme Court? Well, that's questionable. If the statute is unconstitutional, Your Honor, all actions taken by the PSC pursuant to the statute are not enforced. I understand that. But I'm just wondering, don't you have to sue the state of Florida or the PSC or place the attorney general on notice that you want to declare this action unconstitutional? That's the only thing that the law requires. Okay. We serve the office of the attorney general, which we did, and it's in the record, and she never appeared, Your Honor. She did not have no appearance for or against any one of the parties. So she did not appear to defend the statute. Of course, she could not attack it because she was the attorney general. So your theory is that the circuit court would have jurisdiction to order the PSC to change the rate because it includes an unconstitutional charge? We didn't ask for that. We asked for the case. The second amendment complaints ask the court to declare that the statute is unconstitutional. And that's it. What the PSC does with that decision, the PSC, we are assuming that the PSC is not going to proceed in implementing or establishing a fee or whatever they want to call it that the court has decided that they cannot do pursuant to this statute. Okay. So probably how the money is going to be returned, if in any way, 
could be something that will have to deal with. It may be a disgorgement, or it could be that the court could order the PSC to now take whatever regulatory action it has to take in compliance with the fact that they cannot implement this this charge because the statute is unconstitutional. Okay. But we, we, I'm, we're not asking the court to tell the PSC anything in particular. We're, we're, this case, the second amendment complaint, and uh, how it's drafted, and we were careful because we've been litigating this case as evidence for a while in other forms. Uh, it's just a facial challenge on the statute. Well, that's, you know, uh, let me stop you there because I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing this as a facial challenge, um, particularly I, in light of the arguments that you make in your reply brief. Um, with respect to why this is premature in, the, in that you haven't had an opportunity to do discovery to demonstrate they've collected all this revenue um, for plants that will never operate. Yes, Your Honor. I'll be glad so to help agree. me with that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. The reason why we have to do that in the reply is because the defendants have basically converted this motion for summary for to dismiss, which should have looked only at the four corners of the complaint. They have converted it into a motion for summary judgment. The face of the complaint has two elements which destroy the public purpose as we see. First, the election that allows the utility to elect total and absolute discretion without any limitations or conditions to not complete the plans after they got the money. And also, it allows them a rate of return on that money for them. That, for us, destroys the public purpose. Under because every circumstance? Under every circumstance. The statute would have been constitutional, and we would not be here if that language about election would not be there. They could have made the statute to say, OK, if you cannot do it or you don't want to do it, that's fine, but you have to return the money or you have to somehow provide a service. They're keeping 5,000 acres in Little County that we pay for, and they're keeping it. And, and, and the reason why we had to address the issue of the windfall profits is because they're saying, no, we're not making any money of this. We are, they are raising a factual issue, so we had to respond to it. That's why it's in the reply. It's not in the complaint. In the complaint, we, went, we were careful to draft a narrow complaint on a facial challenge only, and that complaint complies with the federal requirement. You're sitting here as a federal court today, because we're only appealing under the federal constitution. So it should not have been dismissed. Let's go, let us go back and let's do a motion for summary judgment if we have to, but we're not there yet. Yeah, but haven't they cited a mountain of case law that indicates that <clears throat> A utility can can do just that charge a rate um, based on you know planning construction that may in fact never occur. Your Honor. So aren't there circumstances under which that's that's not an impairment of contract? No, Your Honor. The way it has always worked is that the laws allow for the utility to recover costs after the plants were operational. The law in Florida in 2006, which was, was when this was enacted, is the first law in the country that provided for this new mechanism, wherein they recover ahead of time and they have the option of not completing. That's it's an anomaly. It's a new thing. After this law has not been declared unconstitutional in Florida, other states have done the same. So they've been following Florida. Florida is the leader of this. Uh, and you say that they're, they're citing a mountain of cases, you know, I, I beg to disagree on that. Uh, there's no case law deciding anything about this particular law in Florida or about this particular charge with this particular clauses in the law of the election. This thing about the election, it is really an anomaly in any law. Usually, a party cannot choose by itself without any condition to not comply with a contract or not comply with something, and there's no consequences. Not only is there no consequence, they make money out of it. The law on its face says they are entitled to a rate of return. You take the money, you make money on the money, and you elect not to comply with the public purpose. That's first impression. That was not addressed in the Southern Alliance case. 
this issue was not raised in the Southern Alliance case. We have no quarrel with the Southern Alliance case. We agree with the Supreme Court that it is on the legislature to establish public policy, yes, as long as the implementation of the public policy does not result in an unconstitutional violation of a constitutional protection. That basic constitutional case law, Marbury versus Madison, Madison up to today, it is for this court to say what the law is, to determine whether this law, no matter if it says it's a public purpose, what does it actually do? Does it violate constitutional protections? We submit that it does. We allege that it does. But again, Your Honor, most respectfully, we're not here today to determine whether the law is constitutional. This is a limited appeal to determine if the motion to dismiss was properly granted. If the four corners of the complaint contain the allegations required by federal law to state this cause of action, it's three allegations and one supplemental allegation. They're discussed in a brief. I'd be happy to discuss them again if the court wants. And they are basically, they are going into detail that there is a contract, that the contract was substantially impaired, that there's no public purpose justifying the impairment, and that if there is a public purpose, it's not adequate or appropriate. And now that we're talking about it, let me go into the details. There is a contract. There is a contract. It's a classic implied in fact contract. The customers pay an amount of money, and the utility provides service for this. And it is a contract because the utility could demand payments in court from the customers if they didn't pay the utility after they provided the service. And vice versa. Does it make any difference that it's a highly regulated contract? What the courts have said about that is that the federal case law, that there's more deference to the legislature in that agreement. But that nonetheless, it is a factual issue whether there's an impairment or not. Although the courts are going to defer to the legislature on the objectives, nonetheless, the court has to make an independent determination as to within that framework, there is a factual violation. If the facts violate a constitutional protection, and you can see that from the cases cited from our side and from the side of the defendant, because in all of those cases, the court didn't stop when they say, oh, it's a regulated industry, that's the stop of the inquiry. No, we have long opinions from the Supreme Court of the United States. Then after they made that statement, it's a regulated industry, we're going to have some deference. But now let's look at the facts. Let's look at the details. The devil is in the details. And the devil is in the details in this case. Election, rate of return. Anyway, going to the second element. The second element is whether there is a substantial impairment of the obligation of the contract. And there is in this case, because the contract was, I pay you money, you give me electricity. Under the law, the customer is obligated to pay money and not receive anything. And if they don't pay the money, they will not be provided electricity. Do we know from this record, out of curiosity, how much the average customer's bill is increased because of this add-on to the rate? Your Honor, that's a factual issue. I think I read in a newspaper something. I don't know that. No, I don't want to go there. But you have alleged a substantial impairment in your complaint. There's no question. I think nobody contests. They don't contest that they're charging, according to the statute. They're charging an additional amount. It's not stated in the bills. It doesn't specify what the amount is. So that is a substantial impairment because before the enactment of the law, the utility had an obligation that could be demanded in court to provide service in exchange for the money paid. Now they don't have that obligation as to the amount allowed under the statute in particular. So that is a substantial change, paying for nothing. The third element is whether there's a public purpose. And that is really the most critical element in this case because the statutes do say that they are pursuing a valid public purpose. We do not contest that the public purpose stated in the statute is a valid purpose. They're independent from 
energy independence, as much energy independence as possible. That's a very valid public purpose. The problem is that the legislature, legislature said, we're going to pursue that purpose, and we're going to establish a scheme to finance that purpose paid by the customers. But the, the utility can decide at any time, can elect at any time. 366.93, parenthesis six, they have the absolute discretion to elect, that's the language of the statute, to elect not to fulfill the public purpose and keep the money. That's not a public purpose. How can it be a public purpose to take the money from the people and then allow the utility to keep it and not fulfill the stated public purpose? It is irrational. You, you needed those 15 minutes. I told you you did. <laughs> I still have five minutes? Five minutes in of your rebuttal. You're, oh, I'm you're 15 minutes in, yes. Okay, thank you, Thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Mr. Grimes? Please court. I'm Stephen Grimes, representing the Board of Power and Light. And uh, this is a facial constitutional challenge. You can start out by saying it's not a constitutional challenge, and then later on said it was a facial challenge. And, and that's exactly what it is, as to whether or not the statute on its face is unconstitutional. At least they cite no law supporting their position at all. Now, uh, as, as you point out, if they think that the Public Service Commission is authorizing more than the statute allows, then their remedy is to go to this, the, the to this commission, or really go to the commission, complain. Uh, although in, in the lower court, the power company did not argue that it was an improper forum and didn't suggest that there was an indispensable party that wasn't there. No, no, we have not, we have not argued that, no. Uh, 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 we believe that, it, it, and their main, well, they have two, two main uh, complaints, of course. And one is that, it, you know, most uh, plants are built ahead of time and the, the uh, companies finance them uh, themselves and then they get their money back and their rate of return after the plants go online. In this instance, in order to encourage nuclear power, the uh, legislature determined that uh, there, there weren't going to get any new car plants built. Uh, and the, uh, the, all of the benefits that they write out, outlined in the statute just wouldn't, wouldn't come about unless they allowed them to get their return costs up front. Uh, and, and that's one of the uh, complaints. And the other complaint is, of course, uh, is that if they determine not to go forward, and if getting a nuclear power plant built and all of the licensing and the, the, the uh, authority from the government is, is a horrendous task. It's very difficult to build a nuclear power plant. And if, they, if their, their concern is that the uh, that, that, uh, the legis that the statute allows them, contemplates it right in there, that if they determine not to go forward with it for whatever reason, uh, that they would not uh, be penalized for that. Uh, and, and, this, the, uh, the, and while it wasn't a direct issue in, this, in the uh, Southern Appliance case, uh, and I, permit me to quote in that statute, authorizing the recovery of pre-construction costs <coughs> through customer rates in order to promote utility company investment in new nuclear power plants, even though those power plants might never be built, is a policy decision for the legislature and not this court. And, and Why isn't that forcing the customers to become investors or members of a co-op without giving them the rights of an investor or the rights of a member in a co-op, though, isn't? Pardon, I misunderstood. You. Well, if normally if something's a high risk, you just go to different investors and pay a higher interest rate or give them greater incentives. And and here we're going to the customers and, and charging them for it as part of their contract without giving them rights as investors, even though that seems to be what they are. 
Well, the statute. The, the, the statute allows this, but, statute, but but isn't that maybe? The statute allows it, and the legislature determined that that was the only way they could they could get uh, nuclear power plants built. That was very evident, I think. But, uh, but, but what about the argument that you've really transformed a motion to dismiss into a, a summary judgment? That they have alleged the prongs of an impairment of contract, and that once they've done the allegations, that a, a lot of what you're arguing are things that may be fact. Well, whatever, if, if the Public Surf, Service Commission, they admit right in the, in, in the brief and also uh, in the uh, second minute complaint that uh, the, we're being paid only what the Public Service Commission has authorized. Public Service Commission, whatever they are, they are paying what they understand the statute <coughs> authorizes. So that there really isn't any issue. It's, it's what the statute is constitutional. And, and, and uh, if, if, they, if the Public Service Commission isn't, author, isn't paying what the statute authorizes, then their remedy is to go to the Public Service Commission and go forward in, in, in that form. But the, the, the decision you have to make, of course, is, is whether the statute is constitutional on its face, even though it allows the cost to, to be charged up ahead of time, and in the circumstance where the, where the uh, statute, uh, where, where the plant's not built, uh, that the uh, the, the uh, customers are, are out that money. There's no question about that. Uh, but but uh, the. Uh, there's just there's no legal authority for that, and, and as we've said, uh, a, a, a two-step process, and they can't buy, they can't get past either one, uh, and the first, and, and the H. Miller and Sons uh, uh, case in Florida Supreme Court <laughs> said that public utilities are subject to, uh, contracts with public utilities are subject to the reserved authority of the state to modify. Them public interest without unconstitutional impairment. And that was a charge, and they were complaining both under the state and the federal constitution. Uh, and, and, and secondarily, even if they were that, you got past that, and it was called a substantial impairment, uh, under case law, and particularly the United States Supreme Court in the Kansas, uh, in the Energy Reserves case, and, uh, and, and a couple of Florida cases, which we cited in the brief, if, if the statute uh, has a, 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 a statement of public policy that's, uh, and there's all kind of public policy that in this statute, sta it's stated in the statute uh, about clean energy and reliance on foreign, foreign oil and, and uh, the reliability of the grid and, and uh, all of that. Uh, and if it's structured so that uh, uh, to carry out that uh, public policy, it is still uh, no, no, not an impairment. And, and the, the statute, it, it is very important that the statute requires every expenditure that they make, that they try to get reimbursed for, uh, they have to prove that it was prudently uh, expended, directed toward what they were supposed to be doing, namely getting the, the, the license and all that uh, to, to go forward. They have to have hearings before the Public Service Commission. Uh, the pub, there's a public council uh, in there uh, representing the public in that case. And, and, and uh, so it, it's structured so that the, the Public Service Commission uh, determines whether they get any particular cost back and whatever rate of return the Public Service Commission provides uh, is, is, is up to the Public Service Commission to do that uh, consistent with the statute. Uh, and and, and there's, there's just no legal authority, no place anywhere, uh, and, and they don't purport to cite any. Uh, and, and there would be no purpose in, 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 in having a factual determination. All they would do is go back and find out what the Public Service Commission was authorizing. And, and that is really irrelevant for, for the, whether the, con the statute is constitutional. It's whether it's constitutional on its face. And the previous courts that have addressed this, of course, have all 
said that it was constitutional on its face, and this is sort of the second bite, the third bite of the apple. The, has there been a written opinion in Florida saying no, it was constitutional? It was, it was, a, it was, it was a PC, PCA, that, and the uh, federal court dismissed it for jurisdictional reasons, apparently. Huh? And the federal court, the federal court, yes, that's true. It was a, it was a uh, trial court had a very detailed uh, 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 opinion uh, in, in Sumter, out of Sumter County. Uh, that was a per curiam. Of course, it wasn't race, race judicata because the, the uh, class hadn't been certified. Uh, and so that's why they're here again in another in another jurisdiction. Uh, and of course, the same arguments have been, have been made. Uh, uh, they, they made they made an impairment argument in, in that other case. Right. So, but of course, uh, uh, was not. And so uh, the, the, it's clearly a facial conflict. Uh, there would be no purpose in in having any kind of discovery. The law is perfectly clear that the Florida courts. Uh, in, in the, in the Florida court has already decided, actually, uh, that they're not in the legal position to, uh, to complain about. I understand why they're complaining, but it's just not legally. Uh, uh, well, one of the things that crossed my mind as I read the briefs in this is this was set up as an impairment of contracts case. Is there any analysis that's been done as far as an improper takings uh, falling within the takings clause? That was raised in the other, in, in the uh, Sumter County case, and it was argued and, uh, and rejected. It was, it was not, it, uh, it was, it, it, we have ample law that was uh, against it. Uh, but it was not raised at any time in this case. Because even though it's teed up as an impairment of contracts case, Pardon? even though this is set up as an impairment of contracts case, it seems to be as much a takings issue as an impairment issue. Well, uh, we submit that it, it's not a, it's not a thing, and, and as I say, it was argued uh, quite a bit in the other case that it was not a takings issue, and, and uh, uh, for what it's worth, I would refer you to, uh, I don't have all the law on hand that I can recite to you, but what it's worth, I'd refer to, to, to the, to the uh, trial judge's opinion in the Sumter County case in which he addresses <coughs> the various issues, I think, and, and I think it would be helpful for you. Yeah. If you have no other... The do we know from the public record whether the constitutionality of this or the appropriateness of the rate was challenged in front of the PSC or in a rate review to the Florida Supreme Court? Whether the what, ha, has a challenge of this sort been made in in an administrative proceeding in the Public Service Commission? I'm not aware of it. Okay. I, I, I can't categorically say that it wasn't, okay. but I think I probably would have heard it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Lugo Honer, before you start, let me tell you that it must feel daunting to you to have to argue against someone who was the Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court. And, and I will tell you that nearly 40 years ago, I would stand where you were, and he would sit where I am. And, and he never thought that he would come back here today the other way around. <laughs> but as daunting as it may be to you and to your clients, the thing I will assure you is that uh, he always treated people with grace and gave people a full hearing and treated people in a very neutral fashion when he was on this side of the bench. And this whole panel knows without any shadow of doubt that he wants us to do the same thing in this case. I know so. that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Proceed. You are addressing the point that you just, the point that with which you finished with Justice Ryan. This case, the PSC or no other administrative agency could have decided on the constitutionality of it. That's very clear from the Sovereign Alliance case in the Supreme Court of Florida. We are correct the law standing doctrine that only the court can be very comfortable with the constitution. So I'm sure there's no no 
statements of any uh, administrative agency on the board. Uh, Mr. Grimes clearly ag ag agrees that it's a facial challenge. He reiterates that point. Uh, I would like to address briefly the problem. We do not contest, we have never contested the implementation, the, the imposition of the rate. The, in this regulated industry, the BSC can increase the rates as we can do. But, but your position is that they should not be able to increase the rate even a penny for these purposes as authorized by this statute then? That's what I'm going, I'm going okay. to specify. They can increase the rate for electricity, which is what they are regulating. But they cannot do it, but it's in for unconstitutional. Is that they're imposing a rate that is not for electricity. That's what the statute allows them to do. And that is one of the reasons why the statute is unconstitutional. It, 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 it pairs with the allegation of the substantial impairment because it changes the nature of the relationship between the customer and the utility. I, and I, may, have mis I may have misunderstood something you argued <coughs> earlier because I thought you had said that in fact they could charge in anticipation of new uh, utilities being established, new power plants being established. But that what was particularly troublesome was the language that they could decline to ultimately build those plants without some mechanism to either refund the monies or apply them as credits in some way. So, so it would be your position is it would be constitutional to allow these charges if the statute were more narrowly drawn to address what happens if they don't build. Absolutely. That's okay. exactly our position. In that language about election wouldn't be there. They would be, we would say, for example, example, they could elect subject to the following conditions. And if they elect the following things would happen, then we wouldn't be here. Uh, because definitely within the industry, they can increase the rate. There's no question about that. We're not contesting that. We, we're not, it, it's not of the way the statute Again, it's an anomaly, it's a new statute, it's never been done like that before, to have that system lower. Uh, Justice Grimes says that we haven't cited any cases. Just to be honest, we rely on federal cases, so we cite them in our briefs. Uh, in specifically, the case of the, the Energy Research Group case. It's critical in this case, and it's interesting that both sides cite the same case as if that's the deciding case. Uh, but it's important to, to quote that part of the case that says the threshold inquiry is whether the state law has the impact operated as a substantial impairment of a contractual relationship. Because that quote from that case destroys their argument that because the industry is regulated, the court should not look into whether there is an impairment. The court, the, the Supreme Court of the United States said, in this regulated industry, you need to look at the fact to see if the law operates into a substantial impact. John or no Silverman, uh, we did uh, uh, have, uh, you, you mentioned the paging. We had presented it in, in, in a previous complaint. We, we abandoned it because of all the reasons that I'm not, uh, you don't want to discuss, but we have considered that too. And we, we did not present it. Now, I do want to differentiate from the Sumter County case, important, because that's the only written opinion by any judge in Florida about this. So the circuit court, uh, I respect Judge Holman very much, we know him very well. Uh, there are two big things that make that decision not applicable today. Well, aside from the fact that it's not mandatory on this court, but even as a, as a, as a persuasive decision. First, at that time, Neither one of the utilities had exercised the election granted to them in this statute. Since then, you have exercised it twice. To dismantle Crystal River, and most importantly, not to build Levi County. They didn't do anything with it. They kept the money, and they kept the land. So our allegations about what the statute allows have been confirmed de facto. They were allegations without confirmation. A reading of the statute has to be confirmed, and that's an important differentiation. Second, at that time, 
the class that we uh, wanted to get certified was a class of all the members, of all the customers. In this complaint, the second amendment complaint, we narrowed the class to only the customer who had contracts at the time when the status became effective because it had an impairment of their contract. So those two different, those two things were not present at that time. Whether that would have made a difference in the form of decision, we don't know. Okay. Certainly they're different. That's my time. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well argued.